name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel reading for tonight from St John chapter 12 is very appropriately appointed for today, the Monday in Holy Week. It is six days before the Passover, we're told, although according to the chronology of the fourth gospel, it is also the evening before Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, that is to say, the evening before Palm Sunday. We are in Bethany, in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The whole episode is is redolent with signs of death and of resurrection. There are three principal characters besides our Lord himself in the frame. So let's think about them a little, one at a time. Mary, the sister of Martha, who true to form is busy waiting at table, corresponds here to an unnamed woman in the Gospels of St. Matthew and St. Mark. This woman anoints Jesus, also in Bethany, shortly before his arrest. In those two Gospels, This extravagant gesture, gesture, this beautiful thing, as Jesus calls it, is explicitly identified by Jesus as being linked with his coming death. The anointing, we're told straight away, is to prepare him for burial. Here in John's Gospel, Mary appears perhaps to be motivated more by a desire to express her gratitude to Jesus for restoring Lazarus, her brother, to life. The generosity of her action, sacramental of her love and her desire to give thanks, is not in doubt. This is not just any old oil, but pure nard from some precious spice, a whole pound of it. Just think of a pound of sugar and think about how much that is. It's enough, we're told, in this text, to cause the entire house to be penetrated by the scent. And this reminds us us of the way in which, in those other Gospels, Jesus says that the nameless woman's gratuitous gesture will be remembered for as long and for as far as the Gospel is preached. Nevertheless, despite, or perhaps because of, this outpouring of generosity and love, death still haunts the room. Mary is giving thanks for the resuscitation of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, in some manuscripts of the New Testament, there is another verse. It survives, for example, in the King James Bible, which expands things so that the text reads, Lazarus, who was dead, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Lazarus, who was dead. It sounds so final. Yet here he is, having dinner at home. Well, the return to life of Lazarus, who was dead, John tells us, was the last straw for Caiaphas, for the Pharisees, and for the priests, who, from the day of his being brought back to life, plot to put Jesus to death. The storm clouds are gathering as this episode takes place. And now, even Mary's generosity provokes opposition, and the second of our three characters steps in. We can deal with him more briefly. Judas, who in the version that we've just heard this evening was, I think, described as being in in charge of the treasury, but in some versions, rather amusingly for us in the Diocese of London, is described as being in charge of the common fund. (laughs) Judas is unmasked as a thief who is motivated only by greed. And here in St. John's story, it is Judas who gives Jesus the cue to make that prediction of his death, which features in St. Matthew's and St. Mark's accounts, and which in John's version, looks ahead to the farewell discourse when on the night of his arrest, Jesus will tell the disciples that where he is going, they cannot follow, but that he will return to bring them to himself. 
What then of Lazarus, who was dead? His function in this episode we have heard tonight is really to be the means of revealing once again the blindness of the unbelieving Jews, reminding ourselves as we say that, that we see ourselves, our blindness, mirrored here rather than blaming them. The Jews come in large numbers to see Lazarus, who was dead and who has been resuscitated, when they should be coming to see Jesus, the source of the miracle, the source of life, he who is life. They should be coming not just to see Jesus, but to believe in him, and so to enter into life themselves. But all they can do is add one crime to another, resolving to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus himself. So what does this little episode show us, taken in its entirety? As so often in St. John's Gospel, we are faced with a range of responses to our Lord, and we are implicitly invited to choose which one is ours. Is ours the offering born of love and gratitude, which is Mary's? Or is it the deceitfulness and greed of Judas? Or is it the stupidity of the Jews who come to gawp at the subject of the miracle, but who fail to see God incarnate under their very noses? It's a fitting story then for Holy Week, and not just because of the place it occupies in St. John's unfolding sequence of events. I've paired these first three days of Holy Week with the first three stanzas of John Donne's A Litany, a long sequence of verses with an obviously liturgical inspiration, written, we think, as the poet recovered from a period of sickness around 1613, though we can't be sure of the precise date. Why did I go for this particular pairing? Well, I suppose, firstly, simply because the middle stanza of those three, entitled The Son, is explicitly about our Lord's crucifixion and about making it deeply and shockingly personal. O be thou nailed unto my heart, done writes, and crucified again. But I chose these particular stanzas for two further and perhaps more subtle, perhaps overly subtle reasons. First, because the conclusion of the very first stanza the Father, makes me think of Lazarus. Dunn prays that God the Father will recreate him, who, the poet that is, has now grown ruinous, an image which in the use of the word recreation makes us think of baptism, but in the use of that term ruinous, of sickness and perhaps even of death, you can't grow more ruinous than that. And the stanza concludes with Dunn reflecting on his own flesh, which, through a mixture of despair and the opposition of his worst to his better self, has become red earth. He prays the Father to purge away all vicious tinctures, all those impurities, or as we might say, toxins, which spoil the purity of what lies beneath. And he ends in expressing the hope that new-fashioned, I may rise up from death before I am dead. Lazarus was dead, and Jesus raised him from the dead. But now, following on Dunn's poem, the thinking in Dunn's poem, we proclaim that God raises us from death before we are dead. And we do so surely thinking of baptism and of our faith in him who is the way, the truth, and the life, and of our life in the Spirit. And then secondly, and to finish this evening, I think there is something about the conclusion of that third stanza of Dunn's poem, The Holy Ghost, which reminds me of Mary of Bethany. Dunn concludes this stanza, this poem or prayer, as we surely can call it, with these lines, addressed to the Holy Ghost, whose temple, despite it all, he knows himself to be. 
he writes, and let, though this glass lanthorn flesh do suffer maim, fire, sacrifice, priest, altar be the same. Now this is quite dense and quite difficult, but the point is that while the body, the flesh, suffers and decays, the fire, the fire of the spirit, burns on the altar of his heart, and the soul, the priest, offers the sacrifice of a troubled spirit. The poem is therefore about offering oneself in love to God, the source of all love. It is about the outpouring of love, the outpouring of self. It is about the inward spiritual self-offering, which corresponds to Mary of Bethany's outward, physical, and dare we say, priestly, sacramental act. So in Holy Week, as we walk in the footsteps of the Lord of life, who is continually renewing us, who is raising us from death before we are dead, so we are invited to make the oblation of love on the mean altar of our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.